Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to the next lecture on the MOOC course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. Uh, you would recall that so far we have talked uh, certain basic aspects of modern portfolio theory, uh, particularly the expected uh, return and risk which uh, forms the two pillars of this theory. And then we talked about in the last class about uh, the expected return and risk of a two and a three asset portfolio and uh, we looked at what is going to be the minimum variance portfolio that is we determined what are going to be the weights which will lead us to obtain the portfolio of minimum variance and also we talked about uh, something which is called uh, opportunity set or feasible set which essentially is the uh, collection of all possible uh, combinations of the weights resulting in different portfolios. So, in today's class, we start off with a discussion on the opportunity set in the context of a portfolio comprising of n risky securities. So, uh, we start off with n securities as an extension to the case with uh, 2 and 3 securities. So, we begin with recalling uh, the opportunity set and we give a visualization of this formed from n risky securities and these are shown in figure 1 and so, let me graphically give uh, what the opportunity set will look like. So, uh, if you remember correctly the opportunity uh, set will be given not in terms of weight, but rather in terms of the expected return and risk of the portfolio uh, obtained by that risk combination. So, we look at two scenarios. So, one scenario I will have a graph like this and in the second scenario I will have a graph like this. Uh, with all these dotted points representing uh, different portfolios and the entire thing together is what constitutes the opportunity set. So, here uh, we will have the minimum variance portfolio and here we have the minimum variance portfolio and this entire set this is the opportunity set. and the opportunity set here and both of them are for uh, n risky securities. So, why do we have two graphs? So, the first graph is basically when uh, short sales are not allowed. That means, all your weights have to be greater than or equal to 0. That means, w y greater than or equal to 0 for all i and the second case it gives the opportunity set when short sales are allowed. So, in the first case, so basically the opportunity set in the first case this looks like scalloped quarter moon shaped and the second case uh, the opportunity set is basically behind the boundary of the opportunity set. So, that means that all the feasible portfolio uh, in case no short sales are allowed will lie within this structure which is a scalloped quarter moon uh, shape and in case uh, short sales are allowed that means your w i can be any real number it is essentially going to be 
the collection of all portfolios which lies beyond this particular boundary. All right. So once you have done with the uh, with this uh, graphical representation, so we can make the observation that uh, all these points that I have plotted, which are actually infinite in number, all points are called feasible investments, uh, which includes all individual securities that means you could have a portfolio of just one asset that is also a legitimate uh, portfolio in the uh, opportunity set and all possible combination of portfolios in general. Okay, so this brings us uh, to Markowitz diversification which forms the uh, backbone of modern portfolio theory. So, Markowitz diversification involves uh, combining. So, the way this Markowitz diversification is carried out is that it involves combining securities with less than perfect positive correlation in order to reduce the risk in the portfolio without uh, sacrificing any of the portfolios expected return. Uh, so, just to sort of uh, uh, give a greater clarity to this particular statement, what you will look at is that we said that the Markowitz diversification, what is the essence of this? It means that you are combining securities, that means you are creating portfolios out of assets with less than perfect positive correlation. So, you are going to essentially in order to attain the benefits of diversification in the sense of Markowitz diversification what you need to do is that you need to create a portfolio picking up assets whose returns have a correlation that was less that are less than perfect that means correlation coefficient of returns being less than strictly less than 1 and this is done in order to achieve a reduction in the risk uh, of the overall portfolio while retaining the characteristic of the expected return of the portfolio all right. So, this brings us to the concept of what is known as the efficient frontier. So, efficient frontier is a part of the opportunity set with a, a special characteristic that, that make uh, the, uh, it very attractive to uh, just pick up a portfolio that lies on the efficient frontier. So, accordingly we start off with efficient frontier with only risky securities. Uh, so, the reason we specify risky securities is because eventually we will uh, talk about an efficient frontier uh, uh, with, uh, 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 with, uh, with risky securities along with uh, risk free security. Uh, so, however, for the time being we will just focus on the portfolio of n number of risky securities. So, accordingly uh, we define that an efficient frontier is a portfolio that has either of the following and I will enumerate them more return than any other portfolio in its risk class. And what do you mean by risk class? This means that any other asset with the same variability of 
returns and secondly it has less risk than any other security with the same return. Uh, so, the first thing it means that it says that uh, if you have uh, uh, for a given level of risk that is either uh, sigma or sigma square, uh, the portfolio on the efficient frontier would be the one which has the highest level of return amongst all those portfolios which have an identical amount of risk and or equivalently it could also be that you fix a level of return and you will have numerous portfolios at the given level of return and then you pick up the one which has the least amount of risk. So, this means that maximum return given a level of risk or minimum risk given a level of return or simply the minimum variance portfolio. So, let us revisit this graphically. So, graphically again you look at the sigma E R diagram and then we look at the opportunity set. So, remember that this entire thing is the opportunity set and I am looking at the uh, case where uh, short sales are allowed. Then the efficient frontier is going to be this part of the opportunity set. So, this is what is going to be the efficient frontier. So, the reason this is the efficient frontier is the following that uh, if we as if we have a certain level of uh, risk say I fix a sigma here then at this level of risk there are so many different infinitely many possible combinations of portfolios at that level of risk and among them I choose the one with the highest amount of return which lies on this line or equivalently if I choose a given level of return then what I get is that at that given level of return there are so many portfolios with different level of risk and amongst them I will essentially choose the portfolio that has the minimum risk. So, it is the collection of such points which give the highest return for a given level of risk or uh, which give the minimum level of risk for a given level of return the collection of all these points is what is known as the efficient frontier and note that this will also include the minimum variance portfolio which is at the tip of the border. So, it is basically the part of the border of the opportunity set which satisfies these two conditions. So, now we state the efficient frontier theorem. So, the optimal portfolio for a risk averse investor will be located on the efficient frontier. So, uh, essentially for a risk averse investor uh, who obviously are driven by the two considerations uh, that are uh, enumerated in the definition of efficient frontier. For them, the optimal portfolio is going to be a portfolio that lies somewhere on the efficient frontier, uh, which will be driven by and the particular optimal portfolio will be driven by the level of their risk appetite. That means, the level of risk that they are willing to take. Okay. Now, let us look at what are going to be the efficient portfolios. Now, that we have got the efficient frontier. So, this is basically a collection of an extremely large number of uh, portfolios that means combinations of words W1 through W n resulting in those particular values of expected return and risk. And so, the next thing to do is that to figure out what is going to be those weights such that the, those weights uh, constituting the portfolio will end up giving you the expected return and risk lying on the efficient frontier and these are what we are going to call as the uh, efficient portfolios. So, efficient portfolios uh, with only risky assets. So, remember we are still considering in the paradigm of uh, risky assets 
we now consider the problem of construction of a portfolio on the efficient frontier for portfolios with n risky assets. Accordingly, we need to consider the problem of minimization of the portfolio variance sigma p square for a given level of expected return E R P. Uh, so, this basically means that uh, it is the minimization of the portfolio variance given a level of expected return. So, it is this problem that where I fix the expected return and then amongst all the portfolios at that expected return, I will uh, or try to obtain the this portfolio which gives me the minimum uh, risk uh, for that given level of return so that I get the weights of the uh, of the portfolios on the efficient frontier. So, for a given level of expected return ERP. Uh, so, in other words, so we can now formulate the problem uh, in more concise terms. So, in other words, the problem involves determination of weights that minimizes the portfolio variance that is minimum of sigma p square and this is nothing but minimum of you would recall that it is summation i is equal to 1 to n j is equal to 1 to n w i w j into sigma i j and this of course has to be subject to the following two constraints namely uh, so the obvious constraint is the sum of the weights equal to 1 which we have seen previously and we now have a new constraint that the given level of expected return is fixed to be ERP. So, accordingly this will be summation W i e of R i that is the expected return of the portfolio this is going to be equal to e of R p that is pre specified. Okay, uh, so, uh, note that just to make an observation that in this setup the way this problem has been formulated uh, in terms of the uh, minimization of this function and this constraint. So, in this uh, set up short selling uh, that is negative weights are allowed. So, now let us look at these two constraints. Uh, so, this the two constraints that we have uh, mentioned above are referred to as what are known as Lagrangian constraints. And uh, we therefore, form the Lagrangian objective function for the risk minimization
problem with two constraints as identified above. Okay, so, then the problem becomes minimization of L into half double summation j is equal to 1 to n uh, sorry i equal to 1 to n j is equal to 1 to n w i w j sigma i j plus lambda into the first constraint or rather this second constraint which is e of r p minus summation w i e of r i i is equal to 1 to n plus some gamma into 1 minus summation w i i is equal to 1 to 1. So, uh, this is what is known as the Lagrangian. Now, observe that this Lagrangian what it does is uh, it accounts for the two constraints as well as the function to be minimized. The only thing you will notice that we have added a factor half here. So, that is for uh, convenience uh, notational convenience and also recognizing the fact that minimization of this expression is the same as minimization of half of this expression. Uh, so, note that the factor of half is for computational convenience. Further, uh, lambda and gamma remember that we have introduced two constants here. So, uh, for this discussion I uh, re refer you to consult some calculus book on method of Lagrange multipliers. So, here lambda and gamma are called Lagrange multipliers. Okay, now, we need the minimization of this L. So, uh, for minimization, we set that del L del W i is equal to 0 for i equal to 1 through n uh, as well as del L del lambda equal to 0 and del L del gamma is going to be equal to 0. So, uh, this gives us uh, the following set of equations. So, del L del omega 1, this will be the uh, sorry del L del W 1, this is going to be W 1 sigma 1 1 plus W 2 sigma 1 2 all the way to W n sigma 1 n minus lambda E R 1 minus the gamma is going to be equal to 0. Likewise, del N del W n, this is going to be uh, w 1 sigma n 1 plus w 2 sigma n 2 all the way to w n sigma n n minus lambda e of r n minus gamma is equal to 0 plus uh, the two additional condition that del l del lambda this is w 1 e r 1 all the way to w n e r n minus E R P is equal to 0 and this basically recovers the constraint that we had here. So, the uh, it recovers this constraint and you will see that the second derivative condition in terms of uh, gamma will recover this condition. Okay, so, then del L del lambda uh, sorry del gamma this is going to be W 1 plus W 2 all the way to W n minus 1 is going to be equal to 0. So, this is satisfying the constraint that sum of the weights is equal to 1. Okay, uh, so, in concise form, we have the following. We have sigma 1 1, sigma 1 2 all the way to sigma 1 n, then E R 1 and 1 then sigma 2 1, sigma 2 2 all the way to sigma 2 n, E r 2 1 all the way to sigma n 1, sigma n 2 up to sigma n n, E r n 1. 
then we have E R 1, E R 2 uh, all the way to E R n 0 0 and then we have uh, 1 1 all the way to 1 0 0. So, this so this is going to be uh, into w 1 w 2 all the way to w n into minus lambda into minus gamma and this is going to be equal to 0 0 all the way to 0 e r p and 1. So, for example, if you take the matrix multiplication of the first row then you obtain uh, the first equation here and then for and then this row here uh, will give you this expression here and this last two rows here uh, is if you multiply them you will basically recover this constraint and this constraint. So, what you can do now is uh, we can write this. So, this can be written as So, this is a n by 2 by n by 2 matrix. So, uh, this is can be written as C which is a n plus 2 by n plus 2 matrix uh, because uh, this is uh, these are n number of uh, rows plus these two rows and I same thing with columns and this vector here this vector is going to be let me call this as x as the unknown vector and which is of the size uh, n plus 2 rows and 1 column and this is going to be equal to the vector b. So, if uh, c inverse exists then we get vector x is equal to c inverse vector v and what is vector x? This is my vector x. So, this solves for for w 1, w 2 all the way to w n and lambda and gamma. Okay, now, let us look at the same problem in a slightly uh, different paradigm. Uh, so, we start off with the formulation of the matrix notation. So, accordingly we introduce uh, certain vectors. So, let w be uh, the vector of all the weights it is uh, it's a, it's a column vector. So, this is w 1 through w n transpose my vector e be e r 1 all the way to e r n transpose and vector 1 is 1 1 all the way to. So, it is a vector of all ones of uh, with transpose uh, taken then how will the two constraints look like? So, let us look at the first constraint that summation w i e of r i this is equal to e of r p and this implies. So, this can be written as w vector transpose into vector e equal to e of r p. Likewise, the other constraint that summation w i i is equal to 1 to n is equal to 1. This implies that w transpose into one vector this is equal to 1. Okay, uh, so, finally, uh, we also introduce uh, sigma p square which is uh, summation i equal to 1 to n and j is equal to 1 to n w i w j sigma i j this is vector w transpose sigma w and here this sigma is the covariance matrix. So, once I have this set up uh, that means, the vector formulation of the constraint and the objective function here, then the problem formulation is the 
that we minimize L which is summation W i w j so double summation w i w j sigma i j. So, we again take the factor of half into w transpose sigma w. So, uh, let me just call this l tilde. Uh, so, this such that uh, these two constraints are satisfied. So, this will mean w transpose e is equal to e r p and w transpose vector 1 this is equal to 1. Uh, so, accordingly we define the Lagrangian problem as minimization of L half w transpose sigma w plus lambda e r p. So, from this constraint e r p minus w transpose e plus gamma and I will incorporate this constraint. So, this is w transpose 1. Uh, so, this actually should be 1 minus w transpose vector 1. So, uh, for minimization As before, we will take the derivative with respect to the vector w with respect to vector lambda and gamma. And this is sigma uh, w minus lambda e minus gamma 1, this is equal to the vector 0. Uh, so, let me call this equation uh, a 1 and this will be e r p minus w transpose e equal to 0. Let me call this equation b 1 and 1 minus w transpose 1 equal to 0. Let me call this c 1. All right. So, uh, using a 1, what do we get from a 1? So, here I can solve this for uh, w. So, w first of all I will take sigma w is equal to lambda e uh, plus gamma 1 and this implies that the vector w is going to be lambda I take uh, sigma inverse on both the sides pre multiplied by that. So, sigma inverse vector e plus gamma sigma inverse vector of 1. Then combining with b 1. So, what I am going to do is that I am going to replace this w in b 1 now. So, I get e of r p is equal to w transpose e which will be the same as e transpose w and this is going to be e transpose I take the w from here. So, this is going to be lambda sigma inverse e plus gamma sigma inverse 1. And this is going to be lambda vector e transpose sigma inverse e plus e transpose sigma inverse 1. Again, uh, combining a 1 with uh, c 1, what do we get? So, we carry out the same exercise with c 1 now. So, this gives me a uh, 1 is equal to w transpose 1 which is equal to 1 transpose w which is now what is w again uh, I will make use of this expression for w this is lambda sigma inverse e plus gamma sigma inverse 1 which is lambda into 1 transpose sigma inverse e plus uh, gamma uh, so, there should be actually a gamma here. So, please make this correction plus gamma into 1 transpose sigma inverse of 1. All right. So, we have these two expressions that if we here. Now, 
uh, what you need to do is uh, we need to solve for this uh, for lambda and gamma. So, uh, x, so we define a to be 1 transpose sigma inverse e that means, I call this to be a I call b to be e transpose sigma inverse e that means, this quantity I choose my c to be equal to 1 transpose sigma inverse 1. Then I can uh, solve uh, this equation. Uh, so, let me call this d 1 and e 1. So, uh, solving d 1 and e 1 we get. So, we are solving for uh, lambda and gamma. So, we will get lambda is equal to c into e r p. Remember that this is the c we have defined. Also, there is one more thing I forgot to add uh, that is I will define d is equal to b c minus s square. Uh, so, with this notation I can solve for uh, d 1 and e 1 to obtain lambda is equal to c e r p minus a over d and we can get gamma is equal to b minus a into e r p over d. Okay, so, it can be shown that that uh, this term uh, b is greater than 0 and uh, c is greater than 0 and as well as d which is b c minus a square this is also greater than 0. Okay, now, let us go back to our original expression for w this was my original expression for w. So, I substitute lambda and gamma in this expression for w to obtain the w to be c e r p minus a over d which is your uh, lambda into sigma inverse vector e plus b minus a e of r p over d uh, sigma inverse 1. So, remember this was gamma and this was lambda. Now, what we do is the following. Now, we can simplify this weight w further. So, we define another set of vectors say g. So, I will define this to be 1 over d into b sigma inverse 1 minus a sigma inverse e. So, it is basically combining this term with as uh, it is actually combining this b term b sigma inverse 1 and this term a sigma inverse e and I call this as a vector g and the remaining terms I will define as h. So, this will I will define as 1 over d into c uh, sigma inverse vector e which is this term minus a sigma inverse 1 which is this term without the e r p. So, then this term and this term combine. So, this will become g and this term and this term combine will become h into e of r p and this is equal to the weight w. So, in conclusion we can say that therefore, the expected return and variance of an efficient portfolio are E of R p is equal to W p transpose E and sigma p square is equal to w p transpose sigma w p, where this is your w p. Now, observe very carefully here, uh, what does this uh, term g comprise of? The term g comprises of sigma inverse 1, sigma inverse e and again uh, 
this term h comprise of sigma inverse e and sigma inverse 1. So, these are same for uh, since these are uh, basically uh, related to the expected return and the covariance matrix of the entire portfolio and this uh, a, b, c and d are again given in terms of this expected return vector and the vector of ones and the covariance vector uh, or the covariance matrix. So, accordingly the g and h that we have here these are basically going to be fixed irrespective of the portfolio that you are taking. So, for be, and the reason I am saying this is that once you have decided uh, to make the asset picking, you already have made up your mind as far as the composition of the portfolio is concerned in terms of the uh, assets that you are going to include. And so, that means you have essentially frozen on the vector E and the covariance matrix sigma which does not change. So, once this is fixed, this is a known input. So, that means that any portfolio that rise on the efficient frontier will have the weights W p given by G plus H into E R p. So, the weights will simply be now a function of E R p. So, you can move the we can choose the different values of portfolios on the efficient uh, frontier uh, by choosing different values of ERP which specifies your level of expected return that you want, but recognizing that your G and H are going to remain fixed. Okay. So, this brings us to the last theorem which is known as the two fund uh, separation theorem. which is basically a direct application of the efficient frontier. So, I can make the statement that all portfolios on the mean variance efficient frontier can be formed as a linear combination of any two portfolios on the efficient frontier. Uh, so, this means that if you are looking at the sigma E R diagram and this is a efficient frontier then essentially it means that so this part is going to be efficient frontier so it says that any portfolio on this efficient frontier say this portfolio can be written as a linear combination of any two portfolios so this means that any two portfolios on the efficient frontier uh, is able to generate the entire efficient frontier so accordingly suppose that uh, we take any two portfolios so, let this portfolios, so let us consider this portfolios P1 and P2 on the efficient frontier uh, such that E R P1 that is the expected return of the two portfolios are distinct from each other. Now, let the portfolio formed by P1 and P2 be denoted by Q. Now, if it is formed with P1 and P2, then obviously there exists a constant alpha such that E of R Q is going to be equal to alpha E of R P 1 plus 1 minus alpha of E R P 2. So, this means that these two portfolios of P 1 and P 2 on the efficient frontier, they can be combined to form a new portfolio Q such that the weight of the portfolio P 1 is alpha and consequently the weight of the portfolio P 2 is going to be 1 minus alpha. So, that means that you already have two portfolios P 1 and P 2 and then you create a new portfolio Q 
which is essentially just like a two asset portfolio or in this case it is a portfolio of just two portfolios with the respective weights be given by alpha and 1 minus alpha. Now, you can see that uh, if you if you want to create any portfolio Q out of this portfolio P1 and P2, then you simply need to put in a weight alpha in the portfolio P1 and a weight 1 minus alpha in the portfolio P2 and how do you determine those alpha uh, and 1 minus alpha? You do it simply by setting this to be equal to E of RQ. So, you can solve this for alpha in terms of E of RQ which is what you specify as an investor and E of RP1 and E of RP2 which is already given to you. So, now we want to show that now as I said as, the, as a part of the efficient frontier theorem we need that any portfolio that you are creating the optimized portfolio is going to lie on the efficient frontier. So, all you need to do is essentially now uh, prove that this portfolio Q will lie on the efficient frontier and then you are done uh, with the statement that uh, any combination of two portfolios in the efficient frontier P1 and P2 in this case uh, will result in a portfolio that also lies on the efficient frontier. So, which means that that is a desirable portfolio from the point of view of a risk averse investor. So, accordingly, so that means that the investment weight so, what is going to be this particular portfolio Q? So, when I say portfolio, I have to specify the weight. So, the investment weight for portfolio Q is determined by vector W Q is equal to alpha into vector W P 1 which is the portfolio P 1 and 1 minus alpha W P 2. Now, uh, since we began with P1 and P2 being on the efficient frontier, therefore, WQ is going to be what? It is going to be alpha. Now, since the P1 is on the efficient frontier, so obviously, it is the weight can be represented as G plus H into E R P 1. So, here I am basically just making use of this result here. Uh, similarly, I will have 1 minus alpha into G plus H into E R P 2. So, I can take the G terms and so this alpha and 1 minus alpha terms will combine to give me G plus I will have the H term and along with it I will have alpha E R P 1 plus 1 minus alpha E R P 2 and alpha E R P 1 plus this term this is nothing but as we have already made a choice this is going to be E of R Q. So, this means that uh, the weight of this portfolio Q is of the form G plus h into the expected value uh, of the return of r q. So, therefore, since it is in this particular form, thus we can conclude that the portfolio q also lies on the efficient frontier. Alright, so this brings us to the end of this uh, lecture. So, just to do a recap, what we did is that we looked at the uh, problem of uh, minimizing the variance in case of an N asset portfolio. We talked about the opportunity set and uh, visualize this in case where no short sales are allowed and in case when short selling is allowed. And then we talked about the efficient frontier, which essentially is the cases where a portfolio uh, at a certain, it is a portfolio which at a certain given level of return is has the minimum risk or which at a certain given level of risk has the highest expected return or simply it is the minimum variance portfolio. And accordingly, we formulated the problem in terms of a Lagrange multiplier problem and then we determine what those weights are going to be and we showed that the weights that lie on this efficient frontier is a linear combination 
uh, of or a linear function of the expected return of that particular uh, portfolio. And that as an application to this, we showed that uh, for uh, a rational investor, it is always uh, reasonable to hold a portfolio on the efficient frontier and for that you do not need to look at all the portfolios in the efficient frontier, but you can determine the weight of the portfolio once you have specified your given level of risk. You can basically determine the weight of the portfolio by taking an appropriate linear combination or an appropriate two portfolio, uh, portfolio in this case which you denoted by P1 and P2 to represent another portfolio lying on the efficient frontier which exactly matches your given level of expected return. Uh, so, in the next class, we will start uh, uh, a little more elaborate discussion on this and we will also uh, over the course of next one week, we will also focus on the situation where in addition to all the risky assets, we can also take into account a risk free asset uh, in my portfolio. So, this concludes our session for today. Thank you for watching.